1993, the African nation of Rwanda. General Romeo Dallaire was about to take up the most important command of his career, leading UN troops charged with keeping the peace. Dallaire is Canadian, the son of a soldier, and a military man who says that his first love has always been the army. And when you were first told that you were going to head the mission in Rwanda, how did you feel about that? An overwhelming excitement. One year later, Romeo Dallaire would leave Rwanda a broken man, his mission a failure, having watched helplessly as more than 800,000 people perished in the genocide. We could have actually saved hundreds of thousands. Nobody was interested. When he arrived in Rwanda, the mission was to monitor a peace agreement between the Hutus and the Tutsis, two warring ethnic groups with a long and bloody rivalry, which was now simmering again. The agreement, which called for Hutus and Tutsis to share power, was just a facade. Hutu extremists within the government were stockpiling weapons. General Dallaire was determined to keep the peace, and it was personal for him. He had been raised on vivid stories of heroic Canadian soldiers who brought hope to Europe after the Holocaust. His own father, his role model, had been one of those soldiers. General Dallaire wanted to honor this legacy. What resources did you think you needed? I had estimated about 4,500 troops. Uh, and I got authority ultimately for 2,600. Just 2,600 troops and none from the United States. Its taste for foreign intervention had soured. A few months earlier in Somalia, two dozen Pakistani peacekeepers had been murdered. US commandos on the hunt for the killers had their Black Hawk helicopters shot down. 18 US soldiers were killed. Kofi Annan was then head of UN peacekeeping operations. The US troops had been killed and dragged through the streets and humiliated. Americans were anxious to extricate themselves from strife in Africa. And the governments were not prepared to take another risk and go into Rwanda. In January 1994, General Dallaire made a chilling discovery. An informant warned that Hutu government agents were planning for bloodshed, not peace. They were going to conduct a, an outright slaughter and elimination of uh, the opposition. Did he tell you that he was being ordered to practice, prepare, train for this? Absolutely. General Dallaire sent this cable to UN headquarters in New York warning that his informant has been ordered to register all Tutsi in Kigali. He suspects it is for their extermination. The informant described a major weapons cache which General Dallaire intended to raid. It is our intention to take action within the next 36 hours. Kofi Annan, concerned about the safety of Dallaire's limited UN force, responded, we cannot agree to the operation contemplated, as it clearly goes beyond the mandate. When you got this response back, yes. what was your reaction? I, I, I it was, uh, if, if a commander's ever been taken by surprise, I certainly was taken by surprise. Did you try to change his mind? Five more faxes of the same nature uh, throughout the rest of January into February. And ultimately, I got authority. But it was too late because Hutu extremists were about to begin their brutal extermination of the Tutsis. And General Dallaire would face a test, standing up not just to the killers, but also to world leaders who turned their backs as the rivers ran with blood. General Romeo Dallaire the head of UN forces in Rwanda knew that trouble was coming. For months, the UN commander in Rwanda had warned his bosses in New York that Hutu extremists were arming and training militias. Then, on April 6, 1994, 
the plane carrying the presidents of Rwanda and neighboring Burundi was shot down. A double assassination. This was the moment the Hutu plotters had been waiting for. The death of the president was the start point, yes. the signal. Colonel Theoneste Bagosora, a Hutu extremist, immediately declared the army in charge. <laughs> Within hours, government troops and civilian death squads began slaughtering Tutsis. People were literally screaming on the phone, telling us that the militias were at the door. We could hear the people still on the phone as they were busting down the doors and opening fire. We started hearing people screaming outside. Efugenia Mukantabana lived in a rural hilltop village when the genocide erupted. And then what do you remember? What I remember is that they killed people, the women and girls were raped, and we saw it all. The men and boys were beaten and slaughtered. As the mob came closer, she and her husband and her children split up and fled. Their home was destroyed. Those are the rocks from your house. As Efugenia hid in the forest, her neighbors, Hutus she had lived with all of her life, killed her husband and five of her children. <laughs> Government radio broadcasts actually incited the killers, demonizing the Tutsis, calling for their extermination. <laughs> Cockroaches. It was an echo of past genocide. In Cambodia, the Khmer Rouge called their victims worms. In Germany, to the Nazis, Jews were vermin. In Rwanda, radio broadcasts went even further providing graphic instructions on how to kill. Pulling babies out of the mother's womb? Yeah, literally. You know, how to, how to make them suffer and mutilate. <laughs> Ephugenia eventually fled the forest and like so many other Tutsis, sought refuge in a church. For her, the church brought safety, but for so many others, churches and schools became their death traps. They'd simply throw a couple of grenades in and let the militia slaughter them row after row after row. Dallaire and his powerless troops could only save the few people they could reach. His troops were themselves targets. 10 were killed in the first days of the genocide, he was desperate for help from UN headquarters. And were you on the phone to New York? Were you screaming to them? Uh, was I was with New York uh, on, uh, fairly constantly, you know, several times a day in those times, doing negotiations, discussing with them uh, the, the, the situation, you know, our reinforcements coming. Six days into the killing, some US officials began to fear the worst. This State Department memo warned of a bloodbath. But instead of providing the UN with reinforcements, the Clinton administration joined a chorus of world leaders calling for a total UN withdrawal. To make statements of following the voting. After two weeks of debate, the Security Council voted instead to let General Dallaire keep just 10% of his already stretched forces. Please raise their hand. In essence, they voted to allow the killers to continue. At the time, Professor Michael Barnett was on a fellowship at the UN, and he studied its response to the genocide. That's when we see a real spike in the violence, because at that point, it's clear to the Rwandans that there will not be any cavalry over the horizon. 
like Hitler in Germany and Saddam Hussein in Iraq, the killers acted with impunity. Let us recognize that it is a failure. In the fourth week of the killing, UN Secretary General Boutros Boutros Ghali ordered a total pullout of all UN troops from Rwanda. General Dallaire refused. So you were insubordinate? Uh, no, well, insubordinate is a nice way. I mean, I, I, I refused a legal order. Uh, and, uh, but it was immoral. With so few men, Dallaire was helpless to stop the killing. In the first few weeks alone, the International Red Cross estimated the body count was in the hundreds of thousands, including people who were slaughtered right here. But the United States and the United Nations refused to publicly call this carnage what it was, genocide. The State Department worried that acknowledging genocide would commit the US to actually do something because of the 1948 UN Genocide Convention, Lemkin's Law. So officials played word games. We, we have every reason to believe that acts of genocide have occurred. How many acts of genocide does it take to make genocide? Um, Alan, that's just not a question that I'm in a position to answer. Anthony Lake had a front row seat to the debate. He was President Clinton's national security advisor. And I think that was wrong. What was wrong? Not to call it genocide. It was genocide. Lake now admits that the administration's response to Rwanda was a failure. He told me that President Clinton's closest advisors did discuss humanitarian aid, but not whether or how to stop the killing. It was a sin of omission of not having that senior meeting, of senior officials never saying, including myself, including the president, what is going on, what can we do about it? While the US and the UN stood by, the rebel Tutsi army fought back against the Hutu government. In mid-July, 100 days of hell came to an end when Tutsi forces led by General Paul Kagame declared victory. But by then, more than 800,000 people were dead. Today, 14 years later, Kagame is Rwanda's president. Did you expect the international community to intervene? Absolutely. All along, we thought that's why they were here. And why do you think they couldn't and didn't? They didn't care. They were totally indifferent. It was just another bloody African situation where just people kill each other and, and that's it. A month after the Tutsis declared victory, General Romeo Dallaire asked to be relieved of his command. Well done, very well done, and thank you very much. He left Rwanda a bitter and broken man. What has life been like for you since? Uh, a lot of pills, a lot of therapy, um, uh, a lot of... Um, A lot of times not wanting to live. You did pretty much all that was humanly possible to scream bloody murder and to raise the alarm. Uh, not enough. I don't think so.